the novels proposed for Vasu Master, When Dreams Travel, In Times of Speech, and Fugitive Histories, and the new collection of essays entitled Almost Home, Cities and Other Places. This year, she was the international writer in residence in Singapore. And at present, we are lucky to have her as the visiting professor at Goa University. Antra is the founder, editor of the Little Magazine, the independent journal of ideas and letters, first Indian magazine to focus on contemporary South Asian literature and uh, offer it in English translation. She is also a literary critic, translator, newspaper columnist, and commentator on the media, politics, and culture. She has edited several books, including the TLM short stories from the South Asia series. She is associated with other media, literary, educational, and voluntary organizations in India and overseas. I leave you both in conversation on literary lives. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this uh, session. And I'm, uh, Gita and I are very happy to be here with you. Although we are not quite sure how um, how much we can talk about writerly lives, um, Gita has many uh, wears many hats. Um, she writes fiction. She writes non-fiction. She writes for children. She uh, is an activist. Um, and uh, she does many things. She's an editor. She also has a new website on Indian writers called Indian Writers Forum. And many things that we can talk about. And uh, I think we should start with Womanly Lives. You started as a writer with your, the first book, um, The Thousand Faces of Night, which was about women's lives. So shall we start with that? Uh, how did I start? I really should say that um, uh, I don't like being called a woman writer because we don't call um, my friend Katie here uh, a man writer. But uh, it is true that, at least in my generation, the important thing at a certain age, if you were not going to lead uh, the kind of life that your parents your extended family, your community, and society at large wanted you to lead, then you couldn't get them to underwrite what you want to do. And as every writer knows, till the day you die, you need to be underwritten. Um, so I'm saying this because I really began a full-time commitment to writing quite late. By today's standards, uh, I was a daughtering old 38 before my first book was published. Uh, because it was very important to have a job and to work and to pay my own bills. So the first novel was in the making uh, forever. I only got to write it because I went to my own maternity leave. Uh, and I was surrounded by women uh, with all these fascinating and completely exasperating stories about pregnancy and motherhood. and. Um, some of it I wrote down, and I knew I had something, but it wasn't a novel yet, and then I worked on that, and that was A Thousand Faces of Night. Um, but I'm going to quickly move on to that, uh, to what happened next. I was very lucky that the first uh, published work got some attention, so I quit my job uh, in a publishing house and took to full-time writing. But the second, Book, which was a collection of stories called The Art of Dying, I think uh, the reaction was very interesting. Uh, for me, these stories were sort of limbering up exercises. I thought, all right, I decided to be a full-time writer, and let me think of my agenda for the next 10 years, and that's why I was writing these stories. But the response that came on too often was, why is she not writing now? specifically about women. Um, and that happened again with the second novel, The Ghost of Asu Master. So um, very early in my writing life, I learned that you have to be truly cussed, not just to write 
every day, that hard journey from bed to earlier desk and now computer. Not just that, but also to say, well, you know, if I was going to have a boss, nobody's going to tell me what to write about. I'm not going to be a specialist. I'm not going to write only about women's issues because I'm a woman and so by some strange leap of logic I'm an expert on women. So uh, widening your canvas is I think the first challenge that um, a writer faces. A woman writer faces probably because it started, it's not it as, yeah. it started yes. as, as a yeah. woman writer writing yes. about women. Yes. Um, but you have very strong male characters, of course, because you naturally write about humanity. And one of the um, one of the interesting things about your characters is that you, it's never uh, the men are very sensitive. They have a lot of qualities that we normally associate with women. As well. for example, you just mentioned Vasu Master. Vasu Master himself is a very very caring, sensitive, nurturing kind of a person who tries to build up his relationship with his young girl. So, has that ever been a, a, a conscious thing because because you want to look at men and women as equals, or has that just come as one of the things that you would do while you're writing? You know, because you you don't you're not very really conscious. I guess what I'm asking is, are you conscious about the gender of your characters, or are they just characters who have their own? Um, well, how can, how can you not be conscious? Uh, of course, if you're writing about a landless peasant, if you're writing about a Dalit woman, of course, uh, that specific experience uh, will color this particular human being, which is not to say that uh, you've forgotten the individual. But, uh, uh, you know, when the ghost of Vasu Master, which is about uh, a retired school teacher in a small town in India, who retires and then learns what teaching is all about and that perhaps teaching could be healing because he gets one last tuition student who either can't or won't speak and he tells us a series of stories to try and get him to speak. Um, when people ask you often, uh, especially about your first novel, this is autobiographical, uh, they thought I was being facetious when I'd say, no, no, The Ghost of Asu Master is my most autobiographical novel. Um, and that is what a fiction writer does. If there's something autobiographical in it, it really is nobody else's business but your own. And uh, in the Ghost of Asu Master, uh, this man who suddenly, in old age, this is his task. He has to learn how to reach this child and how to heal, not only him, but himself, because he feels he's been a failure as a teacher. And I don't think there's any parent in this audience, certainly not any mother in this audience, who doesn't know what that is all about. So to me, that was actually the uh, most autobiographical, because when we talk about teaching and healing, we talk about an entire society, and how do you teach people, and so on. So no, uh, I think you would be a very poor writer if you, uh, used your feminism, about which I will talk later because the word is misused so grossly, uh, to tilted cabbages. So, you know, uh, what could my life be without men? So it's a continuous tussle, it's a continuous, it's almost like writers and publishers. <laughs> but maybe, maybe not so much like writers and publishers because you're more I mean, you build things together. Now that we have a choice. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's true. Which, actually, if we can move away from your uh, writing a bit to um, your activism, um, because this reminds me of the case that you fought with your husband, Mohan. Um, it was a case about the natural guardianship of the child, and the two of you fought it together to make sure that the mother is recognized by the courts as the natural guardian. Now that is something that would have been very different if you were fighting alone as a woman. It would be like you were fighting a male society. Here, both of you together were fighting a male-dominated society, but you were not fighting 
uh, men in general. What, you know, quickly let me say, I'm, I'm a little nervous of being called an activist because I, uh, the shadow in my head laughs a little cruelly. Um, and also it's unfair to uh, the range of activists we have all over the country who do this day after day. Um, so uh, I don't know what to call myself, but I think it's engaged citizen might be more precise. And this specific case happened um, not, uh, you know, at one point in the Supreme Court, uh, one of the judges said, does she really want to make this investment? It was an investment I was making in something as boring and respectable as RBI bonds in the name of my mind and son with my own earnings on which I pay tax. Uh, and he said, is this only a matter of principle? Uh, for me, this was an eye-opener, you know? And I thought, you know, Mr. Judge, what do you think this court is all about? Why are you here? It is, this is what it's all about. It's a matter of principle. And that actually brings together the idea of um, how do we fight for equality? Um, it's, it's not a question of men versus women. It's a question of rational people who believe in equality, who know, who know if they use their brains, that of course we're all equal. You know, you don't, you don't need somebody to teach you that. You don't need a law to tell you that a mother is not just a caretaker, but she can also be the guardian. But quickly, I must, I must entertain them with what the meaning of natural guardianship is. Uh, quite by accident, as I said, when I went to, I'm not, I don't have a salary, so when I got an advance, I quickly dashed off to RPI uh, to make, a, 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 to buy a bond for 20,000 rupees in the name of my little son, then little. Um, and they said, uh, oh, you can't do this. So I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you're not the natural guardian of your son. So, of course, this was middle class arrogance. So I stood up as tall as I could and I said, do you know the meaning of the word natural? <laughs> you can't be more natural than this. You know, they didn't tell me this when I was in the labor room. Um, and of course they said, Madam, don't get angry with us, it is the law. And I said, what law? They said, the Hindu personal law. So I said, all right, don't put me down as Hindu. Now this was my first shock to discover I had to be something when we have a perfectly rational constitution. So then they looked at this unbending Brahminical name, Hariharan, and said, shall we put you down as Muslim? So I hiccuped a few times and uh, said, you know, put me down as Buddhist. I thought, you know, let me be clever here. And uh, they said, oh no, those are all subsumed. So by process of elimination, you had to be something. So um, I went home had a quick quarrel, quarrel with my husband, and we made up when we discovered we were on the same side. And we went to Indra Jaisi and the Lawyers Collective, and they did this pro bono. And if this was to challenge the Hindu Guardianship Act, which says that the mother, the Hindu mother, is only the natural guardian if she's not married, because of course, illegitimate children don't matter. Um, uh, and if the man can be, if he's dead, the father's dead, he can be proved unfit in court, or if he's taken to Vana Prasita, which was my favorite. <laughs> Send him off to Vana Prasita, yeah. So actually, now they do um, illegitimate children, uh, I mean, children born out of wedlock, are uh, also um, given the same um, legal status, yeah. I think. I think you know, I think the law only matters no. if, if, if it, it's used as a precedent. Um, so that is just one stage where uh, you know you have to you have to talk about equality. Um, we, I would like uh, the audience to participate. So before we go on to that, um, a quick word about your um, involvement with Palestine and and you also um, edited a book, Lina's in it, um, a book um, of essays on Palestine. So do you want to talk a bit about that and then maybe read a bit from your non-fiction, from your book of essays, which is new? Um, okay. Maybe a disobedient... Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. 
I'm, I'm not going to talk about Palestine, uh, not because, I mean, we always need to talk about Palestine, and all I'm going to say is that uh, our solidarity with Palestine should stem out of the fact that we have a certain vision of India, and our idea of India was that from the freedom movement, not an uncontested idea of India, remember, was that we would always be with any um, anti-colonial struggle. And um, since the 90s, of course, we've seen uh, the, the growing intimacy between Israel and India, uh, and, and which in a way makes us complicit without our permission in what uh, uh, Israel is doing. But um, having started with the idea of India, I really want at this moment to talk about the idea of India, and uh, that is, that is if, that be very great if I may that's read, something, yes, that's uh, something I wanted to ask you also about because you mm -hmm. have been, you know, as a feminist, of course, the personal is political, but uh, you have been very overtly writing about power politics, and you've also been writing in your, your um, you know, in times of siege and you know books like that have actually been talking about sectarianism about. <coughs> You know, power politics in different ways. Could we? Do you want to talk a little bit about that before you start reading? Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to say I think you know, as when you grow as a as a person, as a writer, as a citizen, I think many of us have travelled this road. Many of us women have travelled this road. Uh, my own entry point into politicisation as a very young woman was through women's issues, uh, but. Uh, a country like India teaches you that you can never live in one little, uh, we have enough ghettos, you know, uh, we have enough special uh, structures, power structures, that you can never, never be part of any women's movement if you are not part of other movements, um, uh, you know, whether they are caste movements or working class movements. And now, of course, sadly, the, if you like, the diversity movement uh, um, of which all of us need to be a part. Yes. And really that's what I want to read. I want to read a little bit about um, an India that we used to know, many of us, and we still want, and an India that we're living in now, if I may do that. Absolutely. I, I, you know, when we talk about diversity, when we talk about a crazy, bewildering, rich place like India, of course we're talking about collisions, because we can't romanticize diversity, collisions and collusions. But there is one sort of collision we all like, and that's a love story. So I'm going to begin with a love story, lest you think I'm always serious. And this is from Fugitive Histories. And the love story is between a woman called Mala, who very much like me, comes from a little place in Kerala and goes to Bombay and becomes somebody else. So she might be born a Hindu, but she actually just becomes Mala, Mala an Indian. And Asad, who is born into a Muslim family, but again is only Asad an Indian, which was possible at one point. And I'm talking about late 60s, early 70s. Mala is in Madras, in her parents' home, summoned to explain why she wants to disgrace them. How can you want to marry him? asks her father, genuinely puzzled. Think of the difference, it'll always be a problem, the difference between us and them. And you said the food in Nasreen's house was so oily, have you forgotten? wails her mother. Her sister Sheila, already married and expecting her second child, writes Mala reams of letters. All of them begin, don't misunderstand me, but if I were you. Some days are dedicated to silent sulks, hers and theirs. Other days split eardrums with piously loud pujas or high-pitched quarrels that usually end with, you're killing us. You'll marry this man and you'll kill us. Her father waves a letter from her grandfather warning them that if they let their daughter go back to Bombay, she may fall into the trap of a love marriage. 
Love marriage, shrieks Mala's mother, tearing up the letter. Who's worried about love? Back in Bombay, in Asad's dingy rented room, Asad and Mala bear the terrible burden of living up to every film and song and novel and poem and political tract on what happens when a Hindu and Muslim fall in love. At least your family is not getting hysterical, says Mala. But Asad grumbles. A woman marrying into the community is just one more womb colonized. Their friends Seema and Ravi have been with them all day. They've had to be fed lunch, tea, coffee, and now run so they can offer their sympathy and support. Mother feels morose. We're not doing this for national integration, she snaps at Ravi. Mother has become almost famous, at least in the neighborhood in Madras where her parents live, and among her extended families scattered across three continents for having eloped with a Muslim. Mala's parents clutch at straws. They summon her to Madras so they can prove to the rest of the family that all is not lost. They assure their sudden influx of visitors that Asad's family is not religious, they're quite modern. Mala's father even adds that Asad is secular. This is a word he has just learned to use. Maybe it will confuse family members who never heard this clinical sounding word before. A great grand aunt arrives one evening, having changed buses twice just to visit them. I hope you're happy, Mala's mother says bitterly as she prepares for the visit. She throws a new silk sari at Mala. I hope you're satisfied everyone is talking about us. Now this horrible woman is coming to look at us like we're animals in the zoo. But when the grand aunt arrives, Mala's mother tells her firmly, they're decent people. Not like us, of course, but decent. She means rich, but she's too decent to say so. The grand aunt is unimpressed. What do you mean decent? She sniffs eating her fifth dose and drinking her second tumbler of coffee. You can teach you to end every meal with curd rice, but what will you do with that name? The grand aunt is more discreet with Mala. She waits to call her alone. What do they do? She asks Mala. Mala has a brief vision of herself as an expert on foreign customs, explaining the eating of meat, the offering of namaz. Or she could enlighten the grand aunt. Can she actually carry it off? Give the scary old woman a watered-down version of some standard liberal speech? The grand aunt can't wait. Her hand trembles as she gets hold of Mala, pulls her closer. Her breath hits Mala in the face in a sharp gust. The look on her face is strange, eager. Do they do it differently? And more often? Her eyes glitter as if on the verge of discovering how to live another 20 years. How many times a night? The questions hit Mala almost as effectively as a grand aunt's breath. The old woman has gone past all those living room type doubts about food and prayer and custom. She's gone directly where this teasing mystery can be unraveled. Where else? But in the smallest room of all, in the bed which fools some into believing in the sameness of all naked bodies, do you find that lascivious skin, the secret of difference? Quickly, I will leave the last one, which is a pity, because it's about a young woman, and we owe uh, another India to her. But I'm just going to remind our friends here of why writers have recently been speaking up in public spaces. We've always spoken up through our work, and this is a tiny sample of that. This is about a, a historian who's got into trouble with something, of course, called the Itihas Suraksha Manch. The minute they want to protect you, women know this, you're in trouble. Shiv must try once again to finish writing the new lesson on the medieval Vijayanagar Empire. What else can a teacher do? What other weapons come to hand? He forces himself to turn to the notes for the lesson that wait on his desk. But this is a lesson he has to write with someone Many strangers, many hostile eyes, looking over her shoulder. He summons Basava's words for courage. Cripple me, father, 
that I may not go here and there. Blind me, Father, that I may not look at this and that. Deafen me, Father, that I may not hear anything else. Shiv's own father, loving ghost, beams. His bakery face lights up with approval as it always does when Shiv forces pen to stuck him to paper. But Shiv can also see the newspaper clippings of a near future, rows of old letters that hang before his eyes like a thick curtain. He sees these letters form words, legible words, they condemn loudly. Any image of the past that does not conform to current theology. He can hear in the refuge of his room the watchdog's interviews. Professor Murthy has distorted historical fact. He has tainted the glory of the model Hindu kingdom of Vijayanagar. He has underplayed the villainous Muslim sacking of Vijayanagar city. I'm not sure. Shiv turns away from the barking watchdogs, but now he hears the plaintive, wheedling voice of the department head. What are the facts pertinent to the lesson? One, Vijayanagar was a glorious Hindu empire, a peak, if you like, of the Hindu past and heritage. Two, the empire was defeated in battle and the great city plundered by the Muslim kingdoms. Why not stick to these simple facts? Despite Shiv's contempt for the head, his stomach contracts. Is it possible to write history or anything else at all if you have to worry about your master's objections, their venal sentiments? Shiv puts down his pen and waits. That was lovely. Thank you. So should we uh, now open up? At, I think we have about five minutes left. Huh? Do, you have, do we have a little more time? Can we yes, have a so we don't dare tell you how much time it Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think I think uh, now Goa University, Goa University. <laughs> Other than that, some of my students are here. Okay. Um, so should we should we now open it to the audience? Do you have questions? Do you want to ask questions? There was another mic here. Uh, good afternoon, man. Thanks. I'm John James Samuel, doing my third year of law. Matt, my question is on a subject you weren't all that happy to speak about here. With regard to the Palestine situation, my question is not regarding the people of Palestine and Israel because the people are always innocent and just made to. I'm, my question is, uh, in my mind at least, it seems that we're dealing with a democratic government on one side and a terrorist organization on the other that even refuses to accept the situation, uh, the right to existence of a state. So, could you please share it? Actually, with that? maybe we shouldn't talk about Palestine too much here because that yeah. doesn't really have much value. Except I'm going to, you know, terrorists. Let's talk outside, outside. and um, uh, uh, we will talk about the various definitions of democracy. You know, there is no such thing as as the democracy in the world. This is something we work towards. So, we will talk about what exactly, um, a, a, what sort of democracy Israel is and how it is brand Israel. We'll also talk about the fact that throughout history, people who have been voted, elected to power, um, you know, you can call them terrorists from another part of the world, but really, it's it's the Palestinians' business. I'm not in love with Hamas. Yes, they say one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. So, yeah, Mila Alexander. Thank you so much um, for a wonderful conversation. Um, so one sees how the life flows into the work and through it. And uh, you know, I'd be so grateful either if you could talk to us a little bit about this very important website and forum uh, that you're spearheading the Indian Writers Forum, something we should all support, and how it's bringing together really um, become a clearinghouse for voices of resistance in different parts of India. So it would be great if you could talk a little bit about Thank that. You. Thank you, Meena, for asking that, because that reminds me, that yeah. reminds me that Andhra actually, you know, when she referred to the site, I have to quickly disclaim ownership. Uh, the whole point of the Indian Writers Forum, which has two websites, the parallel tracks of uh, the lives of cultural practitioners, not just writers, is the Indian Cultural Forum, uh, www.indianculturalforum.in, which 
um, looks at cultural politics in different ways, and Guftugu, which is an e-journal of culture. Um, I want to say that this is a platform, the Indian Writers Forum is a platform that belongs to everybody. There's no membership, there is a trust, but it belongs to everyone, every group, every individual, except those who check each other's fridges, those who beat up or kill people they disagree with, and those who believe the regimes did cutting edge science. So except for those, everybody is already part of the forum. And uh, what we are trying to do, um, you know, we launched the sites on October 1st. Um, people like Keki, Mina, who have all been with us from the beginning as we talked about it. Uh, in five days, I don't think we were quite prepared. We knew there was hunger for a platform which is not linked to any political party uh, where we could... I, I, do, I do want to say that the uh, initiative is actually debate and discussion. That instead of reducing uh, you know, the idea of cultural diversity, or to who is intolerant, who is tolerant, and we're learning these words afresh from a lot of people, or we are finding that we have a culture minister who tells us, why don't they just go back and write? Now, the point is that yeah, it has says, let yes. them not write. Let them not write. Yeah. Yes. He said, let them not write. He doesn't care because he obviously doesn't read. So, you know, what does he care? So, really, the point is we've come to a moment, all of us, filmmakers, writers, artists, uh, who we're saying this is a moment in our cultural lives where we are speaking up in our different ways for the first time perhaps since independent India, in such a powerful way. It's not that people have not spoken up before against the emergency, against uh, the Kashmiri pundits being forced out, against what happens in the Northeast or Kashmir. We've all spoken up against the old fault lines of caste. So that is not the point. We've chosen what we could speak up about. But there is a moment today that I think we need to seize. It has nothing to do with love for the Congress, which very few of us have. It has to do with a grave threat to the way in which we live, eat, dress, write, read, listen to music, watch films. Absolutely. But the way that we lead our individual lives. That and is... do, do, do contribute your work, contribute your work, your money, uh, your Time. Network, time, uh, because that's the only way we can sustain this. Any other question? No? Okay, you're happy. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fine, so shall we wrap it up then? Thank you very much, Gita, and thank you all.